uh, even during this this talk right now, you can still participate in our online raffle and have a chance to win big money and also contribute to science, education, and LRI. So uh, please stand by for just another minute and uh, we will be ready to go momentarily. All right, I'm counting down. Five, mm -hmm. four, three, two, one. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Patty Jones. I am the treasurer of the Arts Foundation Illinois chapter. Um, Arts Foundation was uh, founded um, in the late 1950s after the Sputnik mission from the USSR was launched, and it was a response to American competitiveness in the area of science and technology. Um, ARCS started in California and spread all over the nation, um, and the Chicago chapter was founded in 1977, and today is the ARCS Illinois chapter. Um, how our organization works is that we are volunteer members um, who work to raise money to fund scholar awards, and the scholar awards go to graduate students in science, technology, engineering, and math at uh, U.S. universities. And each chapter is geographically located and has member universities in its geographical area. The Chicago chapter started off just funding places in Chicago, but now we are the Illinois chapter and we have five member universities. We have the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is where I and my our speaker today, Dr. Tracy Wazalek, are. We also have the University of Chicago, the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, Northwestern University, uh, and the Loyola uh, Strict School of Medicine. So we have scholars that are funded every year by us and we give them unrestricted funds to do whatever they need to do to do great science. So it's a wonderful organization and I'm really proud to have supported hundreds of awards in the last 30 odd years of our existence. So um, this month, as you hopefully all know, we have been doing an online uh, fundraising event uh, to cope with the COVID uh, situation that we're in. So um, hopefully you can all see on your screen that there's a participate in the raffle button on the bottom of the screen so you can still donate right now. <laughs> and at the end of the hour is when we will be, uh, when Sarah, our president, who is on the uh, on the in the background running this show, um, she's going to use the magical event groove um, system to pull the winner randomly, and then will uh, let me know who that is, and then I will announce that around six o'clock. So please uh, go ahead and uh, uh, buy some more virtual raffle tickets right now. That just means you're making an online donation, and then the equivalent, uh, and we have a little formula to make an equivalent set of virtual tickets, and that's how we will pick the winner. So, um, with no further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce our uh, science speaker for this evening. Um, Dr. Tracy Uzalek is with us. Uh, she is the director of the Biomedical Imaging Center at the Bepin Institute for Advanced Science Technology here at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And Tracy and I have worked together for, um, for many years now. Um, she is trained in psychology um, as a kind of clinical neuropsychologist. And um, the main thing she'll be talking tonight, tonight about is the um, use of magnetic resonance imaging technology to understand the human brain and the human mind. Mm -hmm. So um, she will have a slideshow to go through, and um, you probably see her on your screen right now. So she'll be giving the talk and going through the slides. Um, you can do a couple of things to ask questions during her talk. We're not going to really interrupt Tracy during her talk, um, but you can use the ask a question question feature, which is a little uh, text button you see down at the bottom of your screen, and that is a way to manage questions and answers. Or you could just put something in the chat. Um, and either way, I'll be monitoring both the ask a question and the chat feature, and then I will be uh, tracking that, and then at the end of Tracy's talk, um, I will um, use that information, those prompts to ask her some questions on behalf of the audience. Um, and we can also... Um, and, and those are the main ways in which you can ask a question. I don't think the audience can use their microphones. So I think you're gonna to have to type a question in the ask a question or the chat feature. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started? So uh, thanks so much to Tracy for being here and I will turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much, so much Patty. Patty. Uh-oh, we'll see how this rolls. I have a little bit of an echo, but I think that's okay. I've got that settled. So thanks so much to everyone for joining me this afternoon. I know it's difficult sometimes and we get a little bit zoomed out. 
I am really excited to have this opportunity to share some of the exciting research that's going on in the area of magnetic resonance imaging and how we're applying that imaging um, science to learn more about the structure and function of the brain. And while I really wish we were all able to be together in person, I have to say that as I was preparing this talk, I was surprised to find who knew that all those hours I would spend at my computer talking to myself and singing to myself would actually come in handy as I'm giving more and more virtual talks these days. So I, as I said, wish we could be together and I'll look forward to the opportunity to having you come and visit uh, Patty and I at Beckman sometime in the future when we can all get back into the same place and get a little bit back to normal. Um, as I said, the big picture is about magnetic resonance imaging and its use in brain science, but I really want to talk a little bit more broadly about some of the things that are going on in imaging and um, what are the opportunities that are in our community to support that research that's going on. Let me, um, while we will focus on the brain, I do want you to know that that is not all we do. I don't have quite enough time and I think that y'all would like to get to dinner as close to six as you can, so I won't go into everything we're doing. But we do study a lot of different systems and functions of, of humans and animals and a wide variety of specimens. I could tell you a lot about looking at um, joints or muscles or livers or kidneys or this, which is one of the more exciting things we've done of late. These are images of a beating heart. And one of the fabulous things about doing research imaging in Champaign-Urbana is that we are a really nimble group and we're ferociously curious. So when someone comes to us and says, hey, we have some um, concerns that viruses like COVID can damage people's hearts. And we wanna understand, can we watch and look at the heart and try to understand if, if someone who's been infected with a different virus, if their heart is functioning differently. So what we did was we brought some folks in that had, had COVID and some that had not, and we did some images of their hearts. Um, happy to say, from what we found, we did not see any issues um, in the very small group that we looked at, but it was a really exciting opportunity to right away take that technology and try to answer a question that was of incredible importance to our community and to our investigators and to our clinicians. So just for, to give you just a little bit of an understanding about imaging before we delve in, just like when you take a picture with your camera, if you were to move, you're gonna get a bit of a blurred picture. It's the same sort of thing with taking these images of a beating heart or a pulsating brain. It can be very problematic because we can't just take a video with the machine. We have to take a lot of different pictures and then kind of knit them back together. So it's a really interesting set of challenges to be able to get images and then to be able to interpret those images. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. And as I said, what we're going to do is focus on what we like to call the big kahuna or everybody's favorite, the human brain. So the kinds of things we're doing are saying we want to understand what does the brain look like? How does it work? We want to know about its structure. We want to know if one area of the brain is different from another. We want to know how those areas are connected. We want to know, do they work together? Does activity in one area influence activity in another area? What about emotions? What about memories? How do those get created? How do they get stored? How does the brain develop and change over time? How does disease start and develop? What can we do to track those diseases and try to improve clinical outcomes? So each one of these questions could be a multi-hour talk, obviously, but I wanna give you a sense for the kinds of ways we go about trying to answer some of those questions. Obviously, there's a lot of different um, approaches we could take. And I wanna give you a smidgen of the history of sort of people's interest in studying the brain. So in the early days, there was something called phrenology. We've had this long fascination with the brain throughout history, and which I think is kind of curious if you think about it. The brain is the only organ that sort of thinks about itself. The brain is eager to learn more about itself, but it's not like your kidney is sitting there wondering about how it's functioning. But the brain actually does sort of question what it is that it's doing, which is sort of like time travel in, on Star Trek. That's an interesting kind of uh, consideration to think about. And in the early days when there was a study of uh, something called phrenology, clinicians, scientists, investigators believed that the bumps on the brain corresponded to different personality traits. So it was interesting if you see on this little um, schematic, we have some different kinds of things, acquisitiveness or a sense of memory or time, different places located in the brain. And you see that the friendship area was thought to be located perhaps back behind the ear. So what that would tell you was if you had a um, lump right behind the ear, perhaps that individual with that lump might prove to be a really good friend and someone you might want to sit next to, you know, at a dinner party. However, if that individual had a divot back there, maybe that's not the person you call to bail you out of jail or if you had some sort of issue. So 
while that is not the case, it is not as though the bumps on the brain correspond to our personality traits. There is, it is true. And what people began as they studied more and more about the brain was that indeed structure and functions of the brain are indeed um, scattered throughout different areas and are interconnected in different ways. There are places in your brain that correspond to, if you were to stimulate them, they would your fingers would move. There's a place in the brain that controls the motor activity of your fingers when you play the piano. There's a place in your brain that processes uh, the sensation of the olfactory, the smell sensations. When you take a nice sweet baby out of the bath and that wonderful smell that new babies bathed smell. So there's different parts of the brain that do those things. And of course they're interconnected and work together to bring about that movement and to bring about that sensory processing. Um, along those lines, it's taken us a lot of different um, uh, we've used a lot of different approaches to try to figure those things out. And again, what we're going to focus in on today is the um, technology known as magnetic resonance imaging. And it's, the, it's been a tool and a technology that has significantly impacted our understanding of ourselves and certainly um, clinical care in our communities. So to understand MRI, let's talk a little bit about MRI past, present, and its never ending future. So again, when we're able to get back together again, Patty and I are gonna hope that all of you will come to the Beckman Institute and have your picture taken beside one of the two first MRI scanners ever to be used to gather clinical images. So as some of you know, Paul Lauterbur was an investigator on our campus and Paul received the Nobel Prize for his work in magnetic resonance imaging. And the fun story that goes along with how we came to house these uh, two pieces of early technology and how we put, came together to put them on display was uh, a few years ago, we had a phone call to our laboratory group asking if we would like to go through a storage shed that was in Urbana that contained some materials and some equipment that had belonged to Paul years before. At this time, um, Paul had passed away and his wife Joan had passed away and there was no one else in the area that um, no other family members. And so they reached out to individuals that had worked with Paul years ago. So happily, the two folks that went out to look in this non-climate controlled storage shed, when they opened the doors, these were two MRI scientists. And when they looked in, they realized they were staring at the very first two MRI machines. So you can imagine, thank goodness, those two were the ones that went out there and looked in that shed. Because had I gone, I might not have known that that's what they were looking at. It was an incredibly important find, something that um, we have had reach outs from the Smithsonian, but at this point, we're not ready to give them up. Really, really are excited to have them. And you can imagine, whether you're a scientist or not, that opportunity to stand next to such an incredibly impactful um, piece of technology, is, is it's really awe-inspiring. One of the other kind of components and what this has brought about is coming up in September, uh, pandemic willing, we will be hosting the International Society of Magnetic Residence in Medicine because it will be 50 years since Paul first came up with the ideas and was able to create an image using a magnetic field. So individuals from all over the world who have studied MRI will come to Champaign-Urbana to have their pictures taken with these first two machines and to have a celebration of the history that um, has been so meaningful and so impactful for us. Um, again, here's just another picture of those, those two pieces of equipment. The field strength of these magnets is really quite low. We're gonna talk about some really strong fields today, but these were quite low, lower than one Tesla. These were very weak fields. And of course our exciting um, companions in our engineering compadres were very excited because the equipment you see between these two red um, pieces of equipment, these two red scanners were um, actually still works. They're still capacitance. There's belief that we could actually bring these magnets back up to field. So far I haven't asked Patty for the thousands of dollars to do that. That, but it's certainly something we are considering. And one of the funny things I think that you might find um, interesting is um, the machine on the left was the first one that Paul um, can, had built. He'd sent the specs out, they built the machine and they sent it to him and it was, it was built in correctly. It was not built with a big enough bore, a big enough hole in the middle to actually get people in. The story was only one of his very small female graduate students could fit in that one. So Paul writes back to the company and writes back to the university. He was at Stony Brook at that time. He writes and says, do not pay. And the amount they were not supposed to pay, the price of the first magnet was $15,688. 
immediately he commissioned another magnet to be built and then the one on the right is the one that was built um, a year later in 1975. The second one was functional and did provide the, the best images to date. Um, that magnet cost a year later $24,700. Still quite a bargain compared to what I'm going to talk to you about today. But the beginning of this technology and being able to have these things again is an incredible, incredible thing to be able to behold in person. So what's going on in Champaign-Urbana that grows from those two early magnets? So as Patty said, I'm the director of the Biomedical Imaging Center, which is a um, one of our shared facilities in the Beckman Institute. We really oversee all human imaging, all human imaging, research imaging in the community. We are now partnering with Carl, and so um, they too are doing a, a, a you know, expanding their um, um, portfolio of human research imaging as well. They have established the Carl Clinical Imaging Research Program, which clinicians will uh, conduct a number of studies within Carl. And then together, the exciting thing that's happened of late is the establishment of the Carl Illinois Advanced Imaging Center. That's the place where we're housing our new seven Tesla magnet that we're gonna talk about and, and what um, is really gonna change the world for all of us. One of the fun things to think about, surprisingly, there we have more than 20 MRI clinical and research scanners in this area. Per capita, at one point, we have more scanners than anyone else in the country. It's a pretty impressive fact that we have this kind of technology available to us for, for clinical imaging and available for us to help develop additional technology that can be used in clinical imaging. It's a pretty impressive number. We have colleagues in Boston that have, are, are envious of the number of scanners we have in close proximity that allow us to pop back and forth between research and clinic in a variety, variety of times. And as I said, it's an, an important and, and a proud moment for this community. This is not just about the university and it's not just about Carl. It is about certainly those two institutions coming together to do new things, but it is really focused on what it means for our community. What can we do here and have the community support and be a part of? Not just having these things going on far away, but for the community to inform, to participate, to ask questions, and to be able to benefit from these technologies in our community. Um, as I said, a lot of what we're doing is about collaborating. And at the Beckman Institute, that's, that's the key word. It is all about doing things together. We really want to make sure that we don't simply use the expertise of one person, but instead, just like a great meal, you have someone who might be an incredibly good at creating that main course, but you'd really love to have someone tell you what wine to pair with it, what uh, you want a pastry chef to bring something special to the table. It's the same sort of thing with collaborative science and collaborative imaging. We really want a large number of folks to come together and tell us, here's the question I have, how can we work together to answer it? This is a picture of recently the new seven Tesla magnet, also called the Terra, coming into Carl. It weighs um, more than 20 tons. Um, you're seeing it sort of undressed, being lowered down into a pit, and that magnet actually sits in the basement of Carl under its Heart and Vascular Institute. While it sits at Carl, it is absolutely a shared facility, and it's been a fabulous um, developed relationship. Um, much like the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, this piece of equipment and this Carl Illinois Advanced Imaging Center is a shared enterprise. It is co-directed by me and by um, an investigator on the Carl side. One of the things that I've come to see, this was probably the 10th magnet we've put in um, that I've been associated with over the years. And what I've learned to do is to photograph as many different um, angles of the machine coming in. And I always take a picture of the crane operator because it fascinates me that you have this gentleman who does not seem to be the least bit concerned that he has you know, a 20 ton, seven million dollar piece of metal being lowered down beside this glass wall into a pit where there's barely room for the men at the bottom and the women at the bottom reaching up to sort of guide that magnet down. They don't look like they're concerned at all and I find that fascinating. I feel like we need to come and scan those individuals brains to figure out. Um, for me I'm not sure that I could sleep for days before knowing I had to put that piece of equipment in. So this picture of it you're seeing as it's going in is it's, it's before it's fully dressed and then this is what it looks like now. So this is the seven Tesla Terra Magnet in all of her glory sitting in the new space. The space is incredibly spa-like. It is the most beautiful magnet space I've ever seen. And we've had colleagues from around the country who are 
phenomenally impressed in the space we have and the way it's designed. We really wanted it to be an inviting center so that, especially because the focus is going to be largely on research, we want individuals to come in and to feel comfortable and to want to be there and to want to participate. Um, I realized I, this is an image of me soon after the machine was in um, going into the magnet. I'm being slid into position by Brad Sutton, who's the technical director of our imaging center on the Beckman side. And I realized later when I looked at this image, um, it's a little bit embarrassing. I was so excited to get in. I just kicked off my shoes when I was on the table. So you see my shoes just sort of willy nilly. We'll be a little bit more organized should you come and participate in the study. I'll, I'll give you a nice place to put your shoes so that you don't just have to kick them off. But it's a really an amazing piece of technology. And this is what the Terra can do. So here are two images. On the left is an image taken from a three Tesla machine. And on the right is an image from the seven Tesla Terra. So you can see on the left, the image is a little more grainy. Um, you don't have the resolution that you have on the right. On the image on the right, you can actually begin to see fibers from gray matter to these white matter fibers going from the gray matter to other places. It's a phenomenal um, image. It allows us to do a lot of things we're not able to do at other field strings. But I don't want to suggest that the, the lower field strings aren't important. They are incredibly important. The 3T and the 1.5T are the workhorses. They are really can take certain images actually better than what we can do at 7T because they're just, the 7T is only FDA approved at this time for brain imaging and for knee imaging. There's a lot of physics and a lot of engineering that still has to be worked out to get good images at 7T. And also at 7T, it takes longer to get the images. And so that's something we'll talk about a little bit as I show you a couple of studies. We don't want folks to have to lay in there for a long time. This image on the right that has such good resolution took a lot longer to obtain than the image on the left that was taken at 3T. So again, we're at that cutting edge and it's gonna take some um, time for us to be able to really use this piece of equipment effectively. But clearly our history shows us this is the place to be doing that. Um, Along those lines, what's interesting about it is just also for you to be proud of and to be to realize that you were a part of that we really pushed that this was an important thing to do in our community. At the time of this installation, it was only the 10th seven Tesla magnet in the country to be cited. That is an enormous big deal. It is the only one in the state of Illinois and probably will be for a while. Um, as I said, it's an expensive piece of equipment. It takes incredible expertise to be able to use. It is not plug and play like a lot of the other kinds of instruments of its type. So it's really crucial that we get it in the hands of those individuals that understand the technology and can partner with the clinicians and with investigators that know the kinds of questions that we really want to try to ask and answer. So this is an image. Um, um, a graphic that y'all have probably seen around the community. It came from when we were first putting to out the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, but it really sort of speaks to, I think, the kinds of things we're trying to do. We want to use this technology to look at the brain and see things that for a while no one could ever see unless you were in surgery. The only things that brain surgeons have been able to see, now we're starting to be able to see. We're starting to understand how information travels in the brain. We're starting to understand the chemistry of the brain. We're starting to understand how it changes and develops. And it's this coming together of these technologies that's gonna let us do that. Our goal is all about develop and translate technology. We wanna grow our understanding of things and we want that understanding to improve clinical outcomes. So the kinds of things that we're really focusing on at this time, really look at the neural side of development, we have head injury work going on, a lot of work in epilepsy and stroke. Healthy aging is a hugely important area for us, as is neurogenerative diseases and spinal cord injury and disease. So we're looking at those areas and we're using the technology to ask questions in those areas. But what makes it exciting here is we're not doing the standard things. In our community, we're developing new technologies to answer those questions and technologies that are homegrown here at Illinois and they are second to none and they're being used all over the country now and being rolled out. So the first one I wanna tell you about is something called magnetic resonance elastography or MRE. And what MRE is, it was developed actually initially at the Mayo Clinic and it was used at the Mayo Clinic. They would use it to assess liver disease. And the way they did it was previously in liver disease, what you had to do was if you were trying to stage um, um, the disease, uh, 
of the liver to see how far things had progressed, you would often have to do biopsies, obviously incredibly invasive, painful. And the, the problem with the biopsies is you went in and do a biopsy, the liver is a large organ. You might do a biopsy in one area and the area that you really wanna study that the disease state is problematic in is two inches away. So they wanted to try to figure out, can we look at the liver as a whole more effectively? And they developed MR elastography where they vibrate the tissue of the liver and then they're able to look at those um, that tissue and determine the elastic properties and the stiffness of it. And that stiffness of the liver told them about the liver disease. So we said, can we do the same kinds of things with the brain? Can we look at the stiffness and the elastic properties of the brain? And if we are able to measure those things, what does it tell us about how the brain functions? So at the University of Illinois, Mayo was so impressed, they actually gave us the kind of machine that allows us to put a little air-filled pillow under people's heads and we gently vibrate their heads. I forever tell my engineers when they are giving talks and if they see, if they say, well, now we're gonna shake the people's brains and tell you how this works. They get the, the uh, sort of the mother hen look for me that says, we do not shake brains. We simply gently vibrate brains. So we gently vibrate that tissue and our engineers and scientists have been able to vibrate that tissue and then look at that tissue and determine its elastic properties, its levels of stiffness and its connectivity of uh, its pockets of stiffness and its, its elasticity across different regions. And why that's important is those measurements of stiffness and the ability to quantify how stiff that is. So our folks can say, this part of the brain is a two and this part of the brain is a six and that amount of stiffness has meaning. In epilepsy, for example, when someone is far um, advanced in their epilepsy and they have a large number of seizures, it tends to cause a lot of damage to a structure called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is in the brain, it's in, uh, deep in the brain, and it's really important for memory. And as epilepsy progresses, those seizures often damage those individuals' memories. Their memory becomes impacted and, and, and constrained and doesn't function as effectively as they would like but we haven't had a way to really understand what stage of that damage was. We only could see once there was sufficient structural damage to the hippocampus, it was very late in the disease. And the only option a lot of times at those um, times was medications weren't effective any longer and surgery became the only option. So what we wanted to know is, can we try to understand what's going on in that hippocampus earlier? And the happy story is, the promising story is, MRE can tell us how stiff the hippocampus is, and we can go from early, early stages where there's very little seizure activity, and we can measure the elastic properties of that hippocampus, and we can track along so that we can earlier try to use different medications and see if we're impacting that disease process. We can know earlier if surgery is the best option. Surgery is a phenomenally scary thing, but being able to do surgery early so that you can remove as little tissue as possible is a huge gift to that patient. The good thing is surgery does often stop the seizures and stop the decline of memory, but we wanna get at that as soon as possible. And this is the first time we've had a tool to be able to do that. Um, it is not only helpful in, in um, epilepsy, it's also helpful. We have a number of studies that are being brought up to speed. We have a study um, using MRE and another technique um, in stroke. We also are very interested in using MRE to assess um, brain injuries, to traumatic brain injuries. This is a, a, a slide from a study that is just being started in collaboration between the university and Carl. Y'all have seen in the news, it's been big stories about um, traumatic brain injuries in professional athletes, especially in football players, soccer players, um, you see it in rugby players. Um, there's clearly, when you have multiple sub-concussive hits, if you bump your head time and time and time again, that tends to be problematic. And so you wanna be able to assess what's going on with those multiple hits. The problem is, even though we can get great structural pictures and you can see some of the wonderful things I showed you earlier, it doesn't tell us things. We need to know a little bit more about what underlies that structure. So MRE has some promise for us in brain injuries telling us about, are those subconcussive hits causing a change in the stiffness of that tissue? To date, again, most of the studies have been done 
in male athletes. And so we really want to, with our seven Tesla and with our research program, we want to be much more diverse in the populations we study. So we decided it would be really um, appropriate to study a, a team of women divers. Now, there is a high incidence of of head injuries in divers. Not surprisingly, those individuals repeatedly are diving during practice multiple times a day, multiple days a week. So it can be a big problem for those athletes. So we want to be able to see, can we track if they're having some issues? Can we track those issues and perhaps be able to help understand, like perhaps it's time to lay off for a couple of days. You might have some inflammation. Let's let's slow that down. Those, and those are big hopes. And I can't say that we can do those things yet, but those are the kinds of things driving the use of these newly developed technologies. In addition to MRE, there's another technology I want to tell you about that, again, developed at Illinois and being touted around the world as a game changer for us in a field of imaging. And it is called SPICE. Now, I learned early on, everyone loves their acronyms. No one loves acronyms more than imaging engineers. If you have a fabulous tool and a fabulous technique, but you don't have a really cool acronym to go with it, it just does not get the attention it deserves. And so this technology, SPICE, stands for Spectroscopic Imaging by Exploring Spatial Temporal Correlation. It's really a fancy way of saying SPICE lets us look at the chemicals of the brain. That's something we've been able to do for a long time with MRI. We could look at the chemical composition of the brain or other structures of livers and kidneys and, and hearts and, and muscle. But we weren't able to do so with much resolution. We couldn't quite zero in as to where um, we wanted to look at lots of different chemicals. We couldn't always do that. We couldn't really resolve where those chemicals were. We knew there was a little blob of this chemical sitting in this area, but we couldn't zero in to really say, how tightly constrained that blob was, and we couldn't say what quantity was there. Again, quantifying stuff is incredibly important if you're going to be able to use that information to treat people. So developed in, um, by a faculty member um, at the U of I and, and, and being advanced by yet another two faculty members at the U of I um, who traced their roots back to Paul Lauderford, the first in the first came up with this was actually a postdoc of Paul Lauderford's name, Jipe Liang. And Jipe developed SPICE with his student, Fan Lam, who's now a faculty member at the university. And they created the opportunity to be able to get that chemical information in five to seven minutes from the whole brain. And they're able to determine the quantity of those um, chemicals and where they're located. That's a huge advancement because again, if you're gonna have a patient in a, in a scanner, if it takes you 45 minutes to get a piece of information, that's too long. And if it takes you four days to process that information, that is not helpful. We need to do things quickly. So once again, these individuals were able to really play around with the acquisition of this data and get to a place where we could get data faster and more of it and quantifiable so that we can actually partner with our clinicians and say, how is this helpful to you? What, what else do you need to know? Just as we use MRE in a wide variety of situations, SPICE can be used in lots of different things too. We're using it to, to look at tumors. We're looking at using it to look pre and post um, strokes. We're looking at inflammation. We're also using it to do head injury. There's a huge challenge in the field in, in neuro-oncology. So with certain kinds of brain tumors, um, you go in and you remove the tumor and then you use radiation for additional treatment. And the course of following that patient's recovery, sometimes it's very difficult to determine is the radiation causing what I think is some damage here in this brain, or is that a result of the tumor perhaps growing back? Those are very scary and very crucially important questions to answer. We think that SPICE might allow us to be able to differentiate between that's tissue that has just been impacted by radiation, or that is tissue that is regrowth tumor and that we need to change our medication um, regimen. So I incredibly promising. Both of these technologies have the power to make a significant impact in really changing what we can do. Um, and I think is in part of why we ended up with the seven Tesla here in an incredibly um, robust and productive relationship with Siemens, the manufacturer of that um, uh, piece of equipment, because they were well aware of SPICE and MRE and some of the things going on in this community. And they want to be the first company, obviously, to be able to license that technology. They were so committed to partnering with us that even though the machine cost $7 million, that's a bargain 
considering what we got. And they also put a scientist here in our community to work with our clinicians and with our scientists to make sure that this machine is able to develop technologies and get them around the country and the world as fast as possible. One other small thing we do um, that's really important to us, just like collaborating, is we love to combine stuff. So when we put someone in a, in a scanner, we're not comfortable just taking pictures of their structure and function. We want to maybe look at their electrical activity and how their eyes are moving and again, their chemistry. And we want them to play a video game. So we try to collect as much data as possible with what, from one subject. And then the other component there, again, speaks to the importance of collaboration. You collect all that data, you can't just process it on your laptop. It really requires high-end computing. And so you got to have partnerships with, with uh, National Center for Supercomputing Applications and those kinds of things. And again, it's why you're in a community that is second to none to be able to do all these things together because team science and doing it as a group is everything. Along those lines, I want to tell you about um, the first big study that's going to be done on the seven Tesla magnet um, and and cheers to Patty Jones because Patty is actually the project coordinator of this study. Um, it is co uh, uh, investigated the, the two PIs. I'm one of them and there's an, um, an investigator, my co investigator at Carl, um, Dr. Bruce Damon, who's just come to join our community from Vanderbilt. And so we're doing a study and our goal is really how do we do, we wanted to do the first study that was absolutely community focused. We want it to be different from the other, while there are only a few other 70s in the, in the country, they're in very high-end academic medical centers in big cities. And we felt like the, the collection of seven Tesla data, this incredibly unique opportunity, has really been concentrated in urban centers and is not a very diverse population. It's not a very diverse uh, collection of data. So we said, why don't we get together Put together a longitudinal study. Our goal is it is being financed by um, uh, the university and by Carl. And our goal is to look at the brain structure function, its activity, cognitive processing, and people's medical health history. And we're using all the technologies I've been telling you about to assess those things. And our goal is to collect data from individuals from approximately 300 people to start. For a long, for um, we're starting off as a three-year plan, but our goal is that with sufficient collection of data and sufficient launching, we'll then have grant dollars and other opportunities to make this a longitudinal study that perhaps for 20 years we'll be able to collect data on these individuals that then allow us to create this database of very unique not only technology, but unique populations that other people can access and use in studies about brain st structure, brain function, and the applications of these really unique technologies. It was really important to us to have the first study be a partnership study and be a study where we show that what we can do together is so much more than what we can do alone. Those are the uh, goals are listed uh, up on the slide. And so we really, again, technology baseline, we wanted to make sure we know how the 7T works and how we can best use it so other investigators can come along and use it effectively. And most importantly, please watch for um, the calls when they come out. We want the community to be involved and we want people to be um, eager to be what we think is really different from anywhere else in the country. And that is a community that is truly scientifically savvy. It is really science educated and is helping to drive the kinds of questions scientists are asking. We don't want the scientists off to their side. We want people then to hear from communities and from individuals to say, these are the areas that matter to us. What are your technologies that might be able to help us address those things? So one other just um, slide I wanted to show you about sort of the medical promise of, of High Field. And that is the exciting thing about High Field is it is going to give us great resolution. It's going to tell us a lot about um, blood flow, which is crucially important for us in the brain. But I want to give you a little bit of the caveat. What's challenging about 7T is all of a sudden we're seeing things that we never knew existed. And so we don't quite know when we see more what's normal. We don't have baselines for 30 years of images to know what things look like under lots of different conditions. So that's going to be an interesting challenge for us to try to understand and to be patient for us to grow that understanding of what is, when you have that kind of resolution, what that means. It's very likely that a lot of the things we see are just, you're just born with that. 
that is just the way your brain is. That is just the way it functions. That's perfectly normal. But we just have never been able to see it with that kind of detail before. And then one of the other things I wanted to tell you just a little bit about is to really highlight, I've been talking a lot about all the things these magnets can do. MRI is phenomenally safe technology. As long as you do not have a device in your body or metal in your body that can't go in a magnetic field, you can go in, in a magnetic field repeatedly safely without any concerns. It doesn't have radiation. We don't use in any of our imaging studies, though there will be some that do, any contrast agents. There's just a, an, an opportunity to use this technology, which is the most min minimal risk is how FDA categorizes it. That's a really big deal. I think sometimes people see the fabulousness of this technology and they think it must be dangerous, but it is incredibly, incredibly safe. And so what I wanted to show you was in addition to the human scanning we're doing, we have a new magnet that also allows us to do animal scanning. And again, what's so fabulous about it is it is non-invasive. We can look at a wide variety of small animals that can really help us understand both those animals' health states and human health states without having to sacrifice these animals. You simply have these animals anesthetized and relaxed and you can scan them and then they can go back to their homes and, and be happy. We do a lot of work on piglets and a lot of different kinds of animals. In the corner of, this, of the screen, you can see there's a circulating um, piece of tissue that was um, one of the legs of an octopus that we were able to see with incredibly high resolution that had never been looked at before. That musculature had never been seen before. There's some fascinating studies done with songbirds. Again, these songbirds, you simply anesthetize them and you can scan them and look at their brains and you can play different music to them. And what's fascinating is you take these little birds um, and of one species, you let them be raised by an, um, a different species that sings a different song that is not common to the species of, of origin. And so they grow up hearing different songs. And so for, for their purposes, they've never heard the songs of their original people, so to speak. But when you play the songs of the original, the species that they come from, you see the bird's brains activate. They are have a familiarity and awareness of a song that they've never heard it is somehow wired into their brains which then is, is fascinating in and of itself. It's hormonally controlled. There's so many interesting cap um, components of that, but it also gives us insights into how humans learn language. Babies are incredibly responsive to language before they're able to form any kinds of words or put sounds together in any kind of meaningful way. These kinds of opportunities to study animals non-invasively and carefully allows us to learn more about them. And as I said, about their, um, their, their human siblings as well. So finally, what I wanted to just talk about is to really help you understand that the future of imaging is ever expanding. This is an exciting time in scientific history. We always tend to say you have to jump off a cliff and build your wings on the way down, which sounds a little scary, but sometimes if you're going to be at the edge of science, that's what you end up doing. And what we've determined is, yes, you have to do that, but then you also have to be a little bit brave, careful, but brave, because what good are the wings you have if you don't have the courage to fly? And I think this community has exhibited an enormous amount of courage to be able to say, we're gonna bring in an enormously complex piece of technology and know that together we're gonna to find ways to be able to use it to answer really important questions. So I really wanna just sort of leave you with the message I have on this slide that this work has been supported by more than a hundred different individuals and certainly our institutions, probably more like 500 in the last five years. It's an incredibly important um, broad uh, group that has been able to make this possible, including community members. And I think it really, really represents what's possible if we're willing to try to imagine what the future can be. So thanks so much. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'll be able to see questions. I may just turn off my slides, but I'll that's give that's it back to Patty. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tracy. That was a wonderful talk. And I think at a great level to um, explain a lot of complex science to a really broad audience. So thank you. We do have some questions um, in the Ask a Question feature. So I will tell you what those are and then you can answer them. Sure. Uh, so the first question was kind of related. You mentioned that the 7T is really, has FDA approval for only brain and knee. Correct. So what, what, why, what is the process for getting FDA approval for imaging other areas and why is it so long? 
we we're, should be glad it's long just to make sure it's safe. What happens is, as I said, MRI is incredibly safe if you don't have metal in your body, but it does involve magnetic fields and radio frequencies. And so what we want to do when you're working with, with MRI, you want to make sure that um, you are not heating up any part of the area in, um, inappropriately or unsafely. And so as you're getting to these higher fields, you need to do an enormous number of studies of different individuals at different weights, of different conditions to make sure that the machine is not inappropriately heating or doing anything that would be unsafe. So it takes many, many, many different sets of clinical trials and different opportunities to do that. We are close. Um, my understanding is we may be able to do, um, I think liver is on the horizon for us. Um, Siemens is the only manufacturer that is able, actually has an FDA approved 7T scanner. So they're working very hard. And right now though, again, brain was the push because the benefits of being able to do brain scans are huge as you can see. So that's sort of why they focused their attention on there at the beginning. All right, great, thank you. Question number two, um, related to the female diver study you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Studying women's brain health is what's the relationship between brain health and like hormones or menstrual cycle or anything like that? Huge. That is a fabulous question. And one of the most exciting things that we, if you invite me back, I'll do another whole hour on the, the hormone component. What's really interesting, what we have found is hormones are very impactful on changing brain structure function and they do it incredibly quickly. So with MRE, we've seen changes between days, like one day to the next, depending on person's hormone profile, it changes the elastic properties of that tissue. So we think it's incredibly important for possibly for these divers, depending upon when they're diving, when they might have more risk um, to their brains. Again, that's that's quite out there. We're not quite sure. And I also want to reassure you as a, uh, a female who studied a lot of endocrinology, I make sure my male counterparts understand when we look at hormone effects on the brain, and especially hormone effects on memory, because we do know they exist. It is not as though women's memory um, goes up and down and all over the place and becomes worse at certain times um, in, their, in their cycle or depending on their hormone profile, worse than men's. What happens quite frankly is women's memory tends to be so much better, it bounces above men's memories. So it's crucially important, again, we've had all these studies on men and on um, male athletes, but the hormonal milieu and profile of women is incredibly important for us to understand structure function relationships. The male data does not give us the full picture for women. And so it's critically important that we have many more women in many more of our studies. Fantastic point, thank you. Okay, question uh, number three, um, you kind of addressed this already, but what are the, are there any side effects from the imaging process? You know, have you, can you scan people on a regular basis over long periods of time to watch changes in the brain? Or that be the problem of the subject. And so we already mentioned cups, which is meant to be longitudinal and scan mm -hmm. at least once a year. Um, so. Absolutely. No, that's another, uh, these are great questions. I think y'all should come in whenever I ever have to give a lecture. If y'all could come, that would be really fabulous. But it is, um, there is no data to suggest that it is not um, safe to, to be scanned multiple, multiple times. And I have to say that both I and our technical director really hope that's true because the amount of time we have been in that mag, especially me, I am always the, the engineering guinea pig so that the engineers can be out running the scanner. We've been in there hours and hours. I sleep in there pretty effectively. If I start glowing at age 92, I, I will write back to folks, but it's incredibly safe. I will say though, um, there is of course an issue. Some folks are claustrophobic and may not realize they're claustrophobic, so they're, they're sliding in. And also a seven Tesla, the field is stronger. So it is um, when you're going into the seven Tesla magnet, you go into that magnet very, very slowly because it can impact your inner ear and give you a little bit of a sense of vertigo. So you have a sense of motion. Um, it is very, very safe, but it is a different sensation. And so we're very, very careful about it. We move very slowly, but there's no evidence that you, there's any problem with being scanned repeatedly. And that is being scanned repeatedly without any contrast agents. So contrast agents are a little bit more complicated if you use those in scan. That's right. Those are radio radioactive, right? So um, some are, some are not. It just depends on. But yes, exactly right. You just want to be careful, and and it has to do with those those agents, how the liver clears them out of your system and such, and how 
what does and doesn't cross blood brain barrier. And so there's a lot of little tricks to those chemicals. And that again, kind of circles back to the excitement of the scientists that are working on a lot of the technologies being developed at Illinois are trying to develop them so that we don't have to use contrast agents, which again, would help an enormous number of people. Again, as we've looked at COVID vaccine development, same kinds of things. We wanna introduce as little, um, you know, difference into the body as possible, but still get as much information as possible. All right, well, let me just tell the audience that I think we've got less than one minute to make your final donations before we call the what, what, raffle winner. So go over to the participate in the raffle button and make a donation and uh, for a good cause and try to win some cash. All right, so <laughs> another, another question we have in the chat is, um, uh, how much impact does AI and machine learning have on this uh, community? Are there equivalent strides in software and modeling in addition to hardware improvements? And then it seems like getting cleaner images would reduce noise and be able to amplify model e efficacy. Well, I'm telling you, you guys are must be plants. These are exactly what I would wish people to ask me. Every one of these questions is fabulous. So absolutely. The uh, head of bioengineering at the University of Illinois um, is an excellent machine learning person and they are thrilled with the possibilities. And I think really helping people understand what kind of data and what quantity of data is really gonna be useful. We're hoping that the resolution of 7T will mean we need fewer images to train an algorithm to allow us to be able to make those kinds of comparisons. So along those kinds of lines, the other thing that's sort of being developed in using machine learning and along those kinds of lines is doing something called MRI fingerprinting, which would allow us to have these high resolution images that are incredibly unique to individuals so that um, you would be able to then tell changes in that individual by different kinds of treatments or interventions. But again, you need that machine learning and you need that incredible computational capability to be able to answer those questions. That's a great question. All right, uh, one other question in general that I think the audience would be interested in is, could you tell us about your own personal career, like how you got interested in, in psychology and neuroscience and how you came to be where you are today? Um, you, you know, I, I, again, I think that, that I've had a lot of students ask me this question over the years and I sometimes feel bad because I know they're looking for a really straight trajectory. And, and if anyone has one of those in their lives, I'd love to hear it because I feel like my path was really quite convoluted. But I started off from very early on working in um, psychi with psychiatric populations. I was very interested in, in, in brain and behavior. And I started off going down that MD PhD road and moved around a little bit. And then what I realized was I really like team science and it was going to be easier to um, be part of a group that used a wide variety of techniques and asked a lot of different kinds of questions. And so I gravitated toward imaging, even though my background wasn't hardcore imaging science, it was much more applying that imaging. But that's where I started off early on when we first developed the first collaboration between Beckman and the, um, uh, and Carl, I was a postdoc and I was the uh, program manager of that first collaborative study. And then things grew from there. The university got its own magnets and I became, um, served on the staff and then ultimately became the director. And this is the most exciting. I keep thinking, well, COVID has made me think, maybe I wanna stay home and work in the garden, but things like the 7T keep coming to town and I can't imagine not being present to see what, what our, our amazing colleagues and community are gonna do with it. So um, came to kind of an unusual place given what my background was, but um, I'm really happy where I landed. Patty, I no longer can hear you. Sorry, I had to put my mic off. So no yeah, um, question about um, sh brain shunts. Mm -hmm. So I, don't know, I, I, I dropped off for a minute, so I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, uh, people who have shunts in the brain to drain fluid, um, I think that you and Brad Sutton and bioengineering uh, in, um, had a really cool little collaboration with an aerospace engineer to computationally model flow in the brain shunt and then get images of it with the MRI. So could you tell us a little bit more about that project? Yeah, that's another fabulously impactful project, again, of our scientists are doing. So just briefly, when uh, individuals have shunts in their brain to deal with different pressures of, of cerebral spinal fluid, um, when those shunts stop functioning, often people's behavior or they become just quite ill, but you don't have a means to measure the functionality or the flow in those shunts. 
So Brad Sutton, a bioengineer, has developed an MR technique that allows you to measure the flow across the, within those shunts. And there's currently an ongoing study right now. We're just about finishing collecting the first round of data that will then allow us to start to move to actual children with shunts. And so once again, being able to measure flow, incredibly complicated, but our investigators have found a way to do it. So stay tuned for that one. All right, well, thank you so much, Tracy. Um, I'm gonna pause there and have everybody virtually thank you and clap um, or <laughs> talks, that kind of thing. So thanks, it was a wonderful talk and you touched on so many interesting areas that you know have a lot of um, meaning to, um, to all of us here. Okay, so it is six o'clock and I am uh, pleased to announce that I do have um, the text message from the mysterious machine that <laughs> draws uh, uh, virtual raffle tickets. And, um, and I don't know if this person is online or not, but um, our winner is Marilyn Schutz. So Marilyn, congratulations. Um, you are going to get a check from me for 25% uh, uh, like of the pot. So I will calculate it out and I will be in touch with you to, um, to make sure that I uh, send you that check. So again, thank you, Marilyn, for participating and win um, having the uh, winning ticket drawn. And yes, Marilyn uh, has been a member of ARCS Illinois for a long time, and she used to be on the board as well. So that's also really, really nice. Um, so, okay. Um, thank you ev so much, everyone. Um, ARCS uh, Foundation Illinois chapter uh, will continue to, of course, uh, raise money. Always go to our regular website, illinois.arcsfoundation.org, to uh, donate to us. But this, uh, this talk and this event concludes our February 2021 uh, virtual fundraising. And um, Tracy, again, thank you so much for and for being a member of the Arts Illinois chapter and for giving us such a wonderful talk. Um, thank and thank you everybody for uh, being here with us tonight. And uh, we really appreciate your support. Uh, we love science. We hope you do too. Um, and please, uh, and if you and if you're not already a member of Arts, please uh, contact us on our website and let us know. We would love to grow our membership and have even more great events. And we do look forward to trying to do uh, in-person events in the fall. Um, We've been doing virtual science talks. We've had a virtual kind of a banquet uh, back in October. And uh, coming back to do things in person will be fantastic. And uh, Beckman Institute is often a place that people come to for um, ARCS Illinois events. Uh, Tracy and I both work there. And so we have hosted tours. We can show people magnets. Um, we can do a lot of great cool stuff. So thank you so much for being here, everybody. And again, thank you to Sarah Vandenplass, our uh, co-president, who has been running this Crowdcast event behind the scenes. Thank you so much, everybody. We are Thanks, signing off. everyone. Bye now.